Hello everyone, I'm Tanya Radzwafia and I'm an actress, writer and director. Welcome to this special online roundtable as part of the Tape Digital Takeover for their season, But Where Are You Really From? Today, I'm joined by filmmakers Celeste Bell and Basam Tariq to discuss their most recent films and how they feature the themes of identity and heritage. So, hello, Celeste and Basam. It's so amazing to have you with me and to have this conversation with you. I, um, I got to watch both of your films and I just wanted to say I was so moved by both of them and just thank you for making them. Um, it, it's so interesting to see nuanced identities being explored in film and, you know, uh, your mother Celeste was just such an interesting character and uh, I, I didn't really know much about the punk scene at that time but to see the influence that she had around that time and how it carries on was just so profound and powerful you know for me as a mixed race woman as well um, so congratulations for making that and going on that journey but some you know I really loved how um, the lead character Zed or Zahir um, was also involved in the world of being an MC, you know, and and exploring his identity alongside his family and alongside the world of fame and then alongside battling an autoimmune disease. And it was just so incredible to, um, to watch these different battles and how you explored them using at times like a sense of magical realism and yeah, I, it was just, um, yeah, just really amazing. So I think what would be really valuable for um, the people watching is if you could both just tell us what your films are about. Yeah, so my film is a documentary, feature-length documentary film. Um, it's about my late mother, um, known as Polly Styrene. Um, her real name was Marion Elliot Said. Um, it's a music documentary, um, it's also a personal story um, and it looks at the, our relationship, so the relationship between my mother and I and also her, um, her journey um, during the punk era, so she fronted a punk band X-Ray Specs um, and the film looks at several themes that sort of were important in, in her life but also important in society wider society so themes such as identity um gender um and spirituality consumerism lots of topics that she she touched on in her in her music amazing amazing wow um my film is uh, mogul mogli i co-wrote it with my friend riz uh, and I directed it, um, and it's about uh, kind of a, a rapper at the cusp of breaking out, but then he gets stuck with uh, an illness that then kind of slows him down, and it's kind of this like weird Sufi horror musical. That's the way I think we've kind of described it, but yeah. That's awesome, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I think, I think what I'd like to know first of all, Celeste, you know, your film was so personal and, and, you know, it was you visiting your mother's history and your, and your relationship with your mother. And I wanted to know how did exploring your mother's career and how other people related to her inform your own sense of identity? Um, really very much. I think, um, well, there were so many different layers of making the film. Um, and one of them was, uh, researching her archive um, of written written material and, and artwork. She did all the artwork herself for, for X-Ray Specs. And uh, I inherited this artwork, um, the artwork and, and the whole archive. Um, and I came across lots of sort of poems and short stories that she'd written where um, it was really clear to me how much she was grappling with identity, with her own identity um, when she was really young. And we had conversations about these things, but um, I think it just gave me a much greater insight into sort of her struggles when she was younger. The world was very different at that time when she was a teenager and a child. Um, and I just saw how tough it was for her. So it definitely gave me a greater understanding of, you know, how in society identity, themes around identity have really changed. Um, and, a lot has changed for the better. There's still a lot, a long way to go. 
Um, and it definitely made me think and reconsider my own identity and where I'm placed within that sort of history, let's say. Yeah, I think one thing I found so interesting um, that you mentioned was that the punk scene seemed to embrace uh, young people of color at that time because it was a movement for misfits, you know. Um, so do, did your mother kind of feel, did, did she feel at home in that scene? And did she, you know, how did that inform her, ex her experience? Yeah, I mean, it was not an, in any way um, a perfect sort of environment. Um, and there was still prejudice, you know, it was still reflective of the wider society. Um, but I think being mixed race in, part in particular, um, you know, that feeling of not fitting in, that was sort of something she, she dealt with uh, throughout her childhood um, very strongly. Um, and it was it was very difficult. So I think sort of getting involved in, in, in that type of scene where no one really felt like they fitted in beforehand, um, I think was quite liberating. You know, we, we interviewed also Rhoda Dakar um, of the Body Snatchers and um, Special AKA, the Specials AKA. And, um, and she, you know, has, has had a similar background to my mother. She's also biracial um, and grew up in Brixton as well and, and, is, a, and is a musician and she was involved in punk right at the start. Um, and so, you know, she gave us, a by interviewing her um, and her sort of telling us about how she felt kind of embraced by, by punk um, because of the very same reasons, I think, as my mother, it was um, it was really informative. But by no means was it super, like, um, you know, um, it wasn't very forward thinking in terms of, I think, uh, a lot of punk was just teenage kids, you know, um, with, who wanted to shock, maybe. Um, there was something kind of poserish about a lot of it. Um, and that also led to some sort of, uh, you know, foolish behavior, for example, wearing swastikas um, on stage and, and as part of the look, you know, and that was obviously very problematic. So yeah, by no means was it um, um, like racially forward thinking, um, mm -hmm. but it was definitely welcoming of, you know, people who may have felt like outsiders yeah so it's kind of contradictory and, and complex like everything it's interesting that you both have music featured so heavily in both of the projects um i didn't actually realize that you'd co-written the film with riz because i was watching it and i was like this casting is perfect because riz you know was already an mc and he's got that music career alongside his amazing acting career um but i yeah i guess i wanted to know about the inception of the whole project and how that kind of started. Did you go into it saying, you know, I, I want music to, to feature in this? Like, I want it to, like, what was that initial process of creating the idea? Yeah, so Riz and I, he was um, in, I'm based in New York and uh, he was um, filming the night of, this was like 2014 when we met and, um, I was working at a butchery. I, I own a butcher shop in New York. So the first time he met, he'd see my film that I did out in Pakistan, a documentary, and he was curious to meet. So he met me there and we just had like a, a long conversation. And, you know, it, it, I realized that so much of our lives, even though I grew up in Queens and he grew up in like Wembley, was very similar. And, uh, you know, we, we just stayed in touch. And I think we did a trip out to Pakistan together because I wanted to kind of see if, because I think there was always this idea that we wanted to work together. We just didn't know really how or what that would look like. So we spent about a week out in uh, Pakistan and I always saw that he always kept like a notebook with him and he always like wrote notes and he was like, he was actually processing the world through poetry. And I was like, that's kind of amazing. I was like, I didn't know that. I just thought that you were some like actor, you know? So um, that was, it was, to me, it was a revelation. I feel like for me as, as a director, I always, I'm just kind of interested in empowering people, right? Like for me, it's like, it's kind of an exciting thing of just like, okay, what, how can I kind of just bring people together in a great way and 
kind of see what what would happen. So I set up the challenge from the start, and I Riz was quite hesitant to be a musician. Um, he had just done a role literally as a drummer in another film, Sound of Metal, right. and um, and I was like, look, you have to be a rapper. Like it's just, it it connects with you, and also that's the way this character processes the world. It's like either you're a rapper or you're a boxer because the way I saw it for, uh, for me, just spending time in London and Birmingham uh, was was the way um, Asian youth and Muslim youth look to both boxing and hip hop. Like, those are the two places in the ring where they could be equals in a way, right? Where they could fight for their equality, whether it was spitting bars or literally swinging at people. Those are the two places they could actually fight for some you know, idea of like I can I can go toe to toe with you. So that's what Riz did. Riz Riz was a was a was a rap. Uh, he he battle rapped for a while. So um, and you can actually find some of his old videos online. And so that's where I was like, look, that's that's the energy and that's the urgency that we need to bring to this because I think something that I was really I get I get really I think um, exhausted in conversations about identity. And, um, and I think the reason, I think we, we all kind of probably feel this way is because it's like, you know, it brings up a lot of shit from the past. It brings up things that's like, I'd rather use and harness the energy and put it into the work and hopefully do something kind of exciting and creative with it, right? Like, just like how Celeste, your mother did something so exceptional. I've like, seen like some of her extra specs, I'm like, what, this is so wild. Why have I never heard of her, right? And, and, it, and I feel like to see people do things with the identity, with, with your creative expression, just gives you permission, right? As another person of color, like, yo, if she, if she can do that, or if they can do that, I can, maybe I can try some weird shit too. It doesn't have to be some, you know, like idiosyncratic, odd, like white dude, you know what I mean? It's like, no, this person did it. So if they can do it, then fuck it. Maybe, maybe I can try something too. So I think that was sort of the impulse with sort of the creative risks that we were trying to take was like, well, let's just try to give this as like almost like a like a, a launch pad for us of like if we could just kind of get weird and we have a little bit of a budget how far can we go and also still maintain a story that we feel connected with emotionally don't make me smash your melon up try throwing a shade of melanin bonafide though i'm seven up you're too sweet, I put the lemon in. They put their boots on our ground. I'll put my roots in their ground. I put my truth in his sound. I spit my truth in his brown. I don't give a fuck about the cash you stack with the crown on your skull. You ain't baski out with the Prince of Denmark. Says Eddie Boy piss on their benchmarks. To white kids wanna be packs. Brown planet is gonna be that. The man frown, panic, and wanna me out, but I'm out. Sterning, cause I stand out. And where I was standing is gonna be twice. <laughs> That's so awesome. I was just thinking as you were speaking about um, a quote from the film, uh, and I think Riz, when he's rapping, he says, um, everybody in the world wants to take their country back. Um, and do, do, do you remember the part I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, it just kind of made me think, um, yeah, we are kind of in the midst, certainly over the last five to 10 years of a of what feels like certainly in in the west as a, a a global identity crisis shall we say so we've had these events um like brexit and you know the trump era and stuff like that where we're having uh clashes of identity across all spheres and it kind of occurred to me that people 
from from a mixed heritage background or at least who know what it's like to have a foot in two different worlds or in several different worlds will be such important leaders for the conversation around identity now you know uh, how how do you formulate an identity in in this kind of global village where we're all we're all kind of mixed and we're all moving this way forward and there's there's a lot of conflict but there's also a lot of um you know harmony and and community and uh, multiculturalism i think celeste are you based in london i am at the moment i actually just returned uh today uh from barcelona so i've been living in spain um for many years and sort of going back and forth between spain and the, and the uk so that's uh I'm quite tired today <laughs> because I just I, <laughs> up super early. So forgive me if I look really knackered. But um, yeah. No, you look great. You've got that lovely kind of sunset light <laughs> on your face. You look fantastic. <laughs> That's so interesting that you moved to, um, to Barcelona as well. I wrote down a quote uh, earlier uh, by Franz Fanon, who's a political philosopher who's done amazing work around identity. And it's um, in the world through which I travel, I'm endlessly creating myself. Um, in your film, you know, you talk about your mom going to New York and, and stuff like that and how, uh, how, how traveling and then to India and places like that, how traveling also was part of her um, construction of herself and identity. What was that journey like for you re retracing her steps and, and seeing how she was received in different places? Yeah, it was um, fantastic. Um, just a really, you know, overwhelmingly positive experience. I, it was actually the first time that I've been to New York myself. So um, it was, you know, um, it's New York. There, there are so many similarities with London in, in, in many ways, you know, the energy, mm. for example. But I don't think you can actually be prepared for you know, the impact that New York has on you, even if you come from a big sort of metropolis like London, and yeah. New York is just that, that much more, even today. Um, and I think, you know, when my mum went there uh, to play, you know, she had played a residency at CBGB's, um, the culture shock, let's say, was that m much greater for, for her. And I, I kind of just got a taste of that, um, that energy, which I find really, um, it's it's thrilling and it's exciting um but it's definitely i can see how it was really overwhelming and um the interesting thing though is that when when she went there i think being in new york really kind of consolidated a lot of her views on consumer capitalism um because the us was that more sort of far ahead with um let's say kind of consumerism but i don't think that's really the case anymore and i think london UK, um, you know, we may be actually the, the center of global capitalism now anyway. So that was quite interesting. Um, so New York was fascinating. And then and, and going to India, I'd been to India previously, but, um, you know, going to these very like holy places that meant so much to my mom because of her, her religious beliefs. Um, and then being able to film to film that experience, yeah, it was just you know remarkable. I, I really, you know, I love to travel, and yes, I, I you know, my grandfather was a, a nomad literally, and then he was a sailor. Um, so it's 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 in the blood. We're we're restless people. Some people think little girls should be seen and not heard, but I think. My mother was a punk rock icon. People often ask me if she was a good mum. It's hard to know what to say. One, two, three, four! Do you think you're a rebel in today's society? Yeah, I suppose I am a bit. <laughs> Holly had her own ideas about everything. She didn't follow trends. She was a woman of colour in an industry full of white middle-class men. Nobody else was singing what Holly was singing about. I fell in love with her. I fell in love with the music. I actually started singing because of her. I must have been about four years old when I realised something wasn't right. The constant cycle of elation and despair. 
I remember her coming off stage and crying her eyes out. It seemed like she'd been through some trauma, and music was a way of dealing with that. Everything else reflects everything else, and the music reflects what's happening around you. People started saying she'd gone mad, but she felt she was going through a spiritual awakening. I'm like an actress. On stage, I'm one thing, and off stage, I'm something else. I just consider myself as a person first. I went through a period where I rejected everything that my mum cared about. But now I find solace in retracing her footsteps. The world is playing catch up with polystyrene, not the other way around. I, I feel similar. I moved around quite a lot as a child and I, I briefly lived in Zimbabwe um, when I was nine. And then I also lived in America briefly. And it was kind of that thing of moving around and and always trying to fit in and, and then kind of, you know, trying to mold yourself into the person that you feel you have to be for where you are. Um, and I think, you know, as I've kind of grown up, it, it's, it has been it has been difficult. I'm actually in Zimbabwe at the moment, and um, I've been here for six months. And I came here on a kind of wanting to get away from the COVID stuff going on in the UK. And before that, I was in LA um, till September last year. I just kind of wanted to get away and come back to my family home here and reconnect with my roots here. Um, but I can definitely. I definitely came back and 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 bumped into some of those issues of like being an outsider again, you know, where like I'm not very good at the local languages, Shona and Devela, like I'm kind of rubbish at those. <laughs> and it, and I, but I but I so want to connect with you know my African side. Um, so Basam, I guess what I wanted to move on to with you is the sense of dual identity. And um, because you're, are you born in America or were you born in Pakistan? Yeah, I was born in Pakistan, so. Okay. I'm I'm really curious, so you're in Zimbabwe now and and how's that been for you with like your family and and living around them? What's what's that been like for you? It's, um, it's been really emotional actually. Um, It's been nice to kind of be away from the West, I don't know what else to call it. (laughs) Um, It occurred to me the other day that when I walk around shops and stuff like that, I'm not immediately treated like a criminal. I'm not followed around. And I was like, oh, that's different. It's weird to kind of be a person in a place and and not a a character or not viewed as a caricature or, or as a, or being assigned a sort of identity that's representative of what's wrong in society, you know? Mm. Um, it, mm. It's weird to be here and, and yeah, just feel like a person. I mean, you know, being mixed, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not black, so I do stand out in, in, in that kind of way. Um, but it, it's just, it, yeah, it's interesting just, just being in Africa and also just seeing how, you know, the, of, of course there is, race there is a racial factor in society you know obviously this is a colonized country they only got their independence in the 60s you know so there's still the um residual impact economically socially of that um but the way they interact with race is is kind of you know different to to what Mm. i'm used to in in london and in la as well I lived in LA for the last like two or three years and that was really interesting as well being brown in LA because there's you know a a huge like Mexican community and stuff like that and I kind of felt almost like oh I I I fit in here just because I'm like brown (laughs) um so that was it's interesting kind of traveling around and seeing how other people react to you in different spaces and, and what that means and how that informs how you kind of feel about yourself in that space Wow. Yeah, you said something that 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 really moved me where, you know, where it's like, you don't have that baggage, right? Like, I remember I read something, 
somebody had said about like how racism makes a man go crazy. And you're like, well, what do you mean? How does it make you crazy? It's like, you don't know if someone's following you because, you know, it, or are they following you? Or is it just you? Or if somebody's mean to you, it's like, are they being mean to you because of some preconceived notion they have of you? Or are they just, you know, mean to you, right? You don't know <laughs> really yes. sometimes what's happening. And I think like, I remember when I was living in Pakistan for a while, like I, I had a decision, I made a decision, I think after I graduated from college, like, man, fuck this, I'm just gonna move away or whatever for, for a few years. So I was living in, in Pakistan, I was in Karachi, and it was the year in Karachi where I think they had more, there were more casualties and more people dying there than in Baghdad during the war in Iraq. And I remember like, I saw the side of a bus and there was this big, and you know, like Pakistan's known for like, Karachi's known for it's like, you know, bus art and like, like every everyone that owns their own bus line, they like design it and they do crazy shit. So this guy put a big, drawing of Rambo, right? Like Rambo with his gun and like people love Rambo there, right? And and, and my first thought was like, God, oh, this is, you know, what are what are people gonna think? They're gonna think that we're violent, we're militant, this and that. And then my friend Susan goes, yeah, but you know, maybe they just like Rambo. And it's like, that's just what it was. It's like, they don't have that. Like, I think because like, you know, when 9-11 happened, I was like 13, 14. So for me, so much of my experiences have been through that gaze of like, what will other people think? And like, whatever I do is a reflection. Like if I'm ever angry, then that means that 1.6 billion Muslims are angry, right? Or whatever. And that's also like how the community then raised us, right? The Muslim community was always like, you know, like, you know, what will they think of us if, if we do this? What will they think of us if that? So I feel like so much of that burden was put on me, but then to be there, I didn't give a shit. It was really kind of exciting, you know? And um, I don't know, I just, I just found that to be very liberating. So, so I just wanted to, reflect back on, on what you were saying about being in Zimbabwe. How long do you see yourself being there? I'm not sure. It's kind of dependent on, on work and, and what kind of happens on that front. But I am I am about to start doing a project with the UN um, around gender-based violence and women's rights. So I'm going to stay here and, and do those kind of humanitarian projects that I've always been interested in and just see how it goes. But it's I didn't expect to be here, um, but in the story of my life, I kind of understand why I'm here at this time. And it's wow. just been so nourishing for my soul and, and needed to, to really connect, you know? I have a question to ask you, if you guys, both of y'all, cause I, I'm just like going through something right now. And, and I think, you know, maybe like, as, as we're all kind of artists processing this stuff, don't, do you guys ever, get worried being away from like centers of industry, right? Like, will you become irrelevant or, or whatever? And how do y'all deal with that? Like, I'd, I'd love to like hear how y'all deal. I mean, I, I'd like to jump in there because I remember a couple of years ago, my cousin, uh, Solomon, he's, um, he's quite a go-getter, let's say. And um, he, visited me in Barcelona and I remember he said um oh you seem so happy here you know it's so great here um you look so healthy here everyone's you know like so chilled here you know it's not like London blah 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 and I was like well why don't you come like just come and spend some time you know maybe you can move here too and he was like oh no but London is the center of of the universe it's it's you know I have to be in London because London is where things happen you know and and he was exactly expressing that fear that he would become irrelevant in um you know a, a backwater <laughs> as he saw a european you know backwater um rather than being at, at the epicenter of, of everything i think the pandemic has kind of really uh shaken that whole concept of there being you know like you need to be in a physical place um and i think we've you know, there, there are lots of so many negatives of, about, I think, remote working and, and I kind of hate it as well. But um, it does kind of change things. And I think what I think we need to get beyond is this idea of like the West in particular. And then these centers like you know, London, New York, L.A. Um, having this kind of dominance over global culture when, in fact, you know, why are, you know, why is the English speaking world still so dominant when English, you know, Spanish, for example, is is much more of a global language in many ways than than English is increasingly, um, you know, and I think it's hard to, and I'm being from London as well, even within the UK, people from London, we feel like we are the centre of 
of the you know we're the most important city in the UK and there are so many people from London who who've never ventured outside London which is is crazy or even cross the river you know some people so <laughs> it's um yeah that whole that whole thing I've always been trying to um trying to well I've never paid too much attention um actually because I've lived you know most of my adult life outside the UK because um and outside of London because I don't particularly like being here if I'm really honest for lots of different reasons <laughs> and my happiness is more important than uh, you know being in the center of everything yeah I um I definitely ca came up against the a, a sort of angst of from being away from like the LA or the industry or you know and it, it kind of forced me to look at myself as a person and, and not like an actress I mean because no one here first of all has seen any of my work so they really don't care <laughs> so I've had to just like um figure out who who I am and what I can bring to situations aside from the work but now, now that I've been here for six months I'm kind of scared to to come back to to that life and I think probably a lot of people are, ha are going to go through that, whether it's even something as, as kind of small as returning from working from home to working from work, as they're now calling, oh, working from work, <laughs> as they're now calling it. Um, you know, th these kind of, I think these transitions have a, a, a kind of strange effect on one's um, mental health and how you kind of conceive yourself. Um, so yeah, right now I'm kind of like, yes, I do want to get back to work. I want to get back to the industry, but I'm also a little bit like, that was a lot. I was working so hard for such a long time. And like, it was, this time out has, has been in some ways, you know, a period of rejuvenation. Um, uh, yeah. You. Thank you. Yeah. So a, f a couple of months ago, I got, um, I kind of got involved in a viral news story completely by chance. And um, I don't know if you know the actress Tandy Wen Newton, she was formerly known as Tandy Newton. So she, she was in Vogue magazine and she, um, she said, you know, my name is Tandy Ware, call me Tandy Ware. And that she said the whole reason, um, why she was known as Tandy in her career was because of a typo that someone else made. And so she then became known as Tandy. And so, you know, for her like 20 years long career, she was not called by, I guess, the full name that maybe her family calls her and everything. And so I replied to, um, I replied on Twitter to this, this, uh, the story about Tandyware saying, um, I'm really inspired by her embracing her name Tandyware. My full name is Tanya Radzwa, which means we have been comforted. And I was named that because um, I was born the year that my grandfather died. And it kind of, it went viral and suddenly it was in like newspapers and magazines and, and stuff like that. And it was so strange because on the one hand, people were like, welcome home. We love you. Well, well done for embracing your name. And then on the other hand, I had people saying, oh, why are you trying to co-opt blackness now? Because being black's trendy now. Oh, now you're African, are you? And it's just, and it was just like, whoa, like I literally just said my name. I didn't even say I was gonna change my name or reclaim my name, but it, it snowballed into this, this story, right? And it kind of made me think of, in, in reference to your films, um, the nature of being public property, shall we say, um, the nature of fame and the nature of uh, the identity in the context of fame and how you suddenly, be, appear outside yourself as the property of other people. Um, do you do you have anything to say, both of you, in terms of your own personal experience or or experience in the film with that? Wow, that's so wow, that's huge. I think I might I might have something to say that I don't know. I have the answer to this stuff, but I find some of these conversations around identity can be quite empowering. But I think it helps the systems of capitalism do great market segmentation and separate us more and it helps the powers that be 
you know, bifurcate us and divide us. So it's an interesting thing where as something of like identity is something that we should be really proud of, but in those distinctions, sometimes we can be quite territorial, which I think is something that maybe you came up against, uh, you know, and I, I feel that that happens a lot with, with me because it's like, I have so much privilege having a blue passport, right? Being a US citizen, but I'm also Pakistani, but like, what does it really mean, right? Like, you know, I'm also, you know, a New Yorker or, you know, and then sometimes I'm in Texas. So it's like, it's like, it's so every, like there's, you know, so there's always people that are wanting to put you in boxes because it's great for the, you know, whether it's like, you know, you look at NGOs or you look at like, I think y'all have it called BAME, right? So people have- Oh, certain, I hate so, that so, term. So yeah, yeah. But, 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 but basically like, you know, but, but they, they need statistics, right? So, and they need, sorry, they need numbers to show that their, their organizations or things are working. So we fit really well into these things, into these systems, right? And we can use that, I think, to a certain degree. But I think for me, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more and more excited on how I can claim identities of, of, of mine that are more values-based where other people can also come on board, right? Like uh, more based on like ethics and not just like, oh, I'm a Pakistani American filmmaker. It's like, yeah, those were things that I didn't choose, but yeah, I am Pakistani and I am American, but actually yeah. I choose every day to be Muslim. And those are things that are based on values and ethics and, you know, uh, perhaps a spiritual worldview. So I would like to be considered a Muslim filmmaker. And I also feel like that's a wider definition and like a, like a bigger, broader definition. Cause I look at, like when I look at like my idols or people that I love, it's like Yasin Bey who, used to go by most stuff yeah. and like as you see him in his like latest videos this guy's like wearing like a moroccan you know a headband and he's got like something from like the gulf countries and he's got something from brooklyn and he's out in the desert and he's just rapping i'm like you know what that's fucking cool because he believes in a value and it's like you know what? i can take from all this stuff because i'm also a world citizen and it doesn't feel like yes. cheeky appropriation or whatever this and that and, and I feel like, you know, I feel like that to me is really exciting, right? It's not like, so, cause, cause it's like, it's based on values and it's based on, on an ethical way of looking at the world. And, and that's what I want to be about now, right? Like, so, cause I think it's easy for them to, to separate us all and say that, well, as a person that's X, Y, and Z and blah, blah, blah. And I think of course, all those identities, just, just to say, I'm not trying to negate any of those things. I think all those things are really empowering, but to me, they're exciting when yeah. the particulars can also hint at a universal, right? That connects us all. Mm, mm. Definitely. And I think just to add to that, you know, often the things that do liberate us, they also, you know, inhibit us, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's there, there's always that kind of um, double edged sword, let's say. And, mm -hmm. um, and I agree about, you know, global capitalism. I think the more unequal we, we're becoming in terms of wealth disparity and you know class disparity, the more emphasis there is from you know or like more celebration there is from large corporations of um, of difference and um, you know and this so there's the the, the pink washing you know of the the co-opting of the of the gay rights movement and the co-opting of various racial uh, justice movements and gender justice movements so it's it seems it it can be can be very uh, come across as very cynical actually mm. um in the way that uh, it's you know different groups of people find themselves actually put into these boxes which are very uh, great for marketing <laughs> you know um so it's yeah it's you know we have to be really really careful and i think i would consider myself to be you know a, on on the traditional left in many ways and uh, i do think it's it's worrying how class is is being um almost neglected you know class and and also um you know income disparity and and economics um, and uh, and yeah, I think you know equality. Um, it's it's all of those things. You know, it is gender. It is it is race. It is um, it's you know it's sexuality. But it's also income. Is is a huge one. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so that's just <laughs> my two pennies worth. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so true. It's so true. On that powerful note and I think we should leave it there because what you said was just so profound and I think we're going to leave people with something to 
go forward with and think about. Thank you. Thank you for joining this conversation with me. And um, thank you for making the works that you did. And I really look forward to what you both do next. It was just such an honor and a pleasure to watch what both of you created. That's it for today. Uh, so uh, thank you all so much for watching at home. The Tape Digital Takeover is taking place until the 4th of July and includes a zine, exhibition, video essays, and their in-venue BFI South Bank season runs throughout July. Thanks so much.